Walter. Yes. Thank, thank you for coming. It's and a thank pleasure. you for sharing your time with us so that we could learn more about you and about your evangelism series. Thank you. My first question for you is, um, where were you born, where are you from, and what kind of a childhood did you have? Oh, I, I have a label here on the side which says, Made in South Africa. <laughs> okay. I come from South Africa. My parents were both German, but uh, my mother was their second generation. My father is first generation. So you were raised and went to school and all your schooling was in South Africa? All in South Africa. I went to the German school. They have a German school there where they had teachers that would come out on a regular basis from Germany. So it was a very good school, yes. And so we know that you're a scientist and an intriguing question uh, of great interest is what were the influences during your childhood that led you to choose science as a, as a, as a career? There was no real influence that I can remember. Nobody that stood out that influenced me, but I was always interested in anything scientific. And uh, I was very interested in biology, and as a small kid, you know, where other kids used to play outside, I was to digging up bugs and bringing bugs into the house, driving my mother nuts, bringing in worms. My room was full of worms. I made ant colonies, I put up a uh, plaster of Paris hives and I had creatures under glass and doing their thing and I loved astronomy and uh, I remember as a kid just, just being able to read, reading astronomy books. So I would, at that stage, you know, Fred Hoyle was the big astronomer and I would read all his books and I could talk about the stars and their sizes and all of this stuff. And so that was interesting to me. And was that interest um, supported by your parents with all of this disruption of your bedroom with these plaster models and critters? No, my mother was very ill. All I remember of my mother is very ill. Mm. <laughs> from, a, from the age of eight, she was almost always bedridden until she died when I was 12 years old. So I was very much by myself. My father was typical German. He worked day and night, night shift, day shift. He was never at home. So I kept myself busy, very mischievous. I would uh, read up about things like bombs and create them and blow up trees and buy the various components in various places. I built my own telescope when I was about eight years old, didn't work very well, but uh, made it of cardboard and lenses and stuff that I got and worked out focal lengths and stuff like that. So uh, from a kid, I was science nuts. Hmm. So it started at an early age and yeah. has continued to this day. Yes. I was very, very bad at school. I refused to learn. And uh, that was because of turmoil with the teachers and basically it started because of religious instruction. My mother was, as I said, uh, very ill and she was Lutheran and my father was Catholic. So I was raised Catholic because that is something that a Catholic promises when he raises children and marries a non-Catholic. And uh, that caused quite a few problems because I was constantly informed that my mother wouldn't go to heaven because of her religion. And that made me very rebellious at school. So I was always thrown out of religious instruction classes. And the headmaster would always thrash me because I was always outside and I would never tell him why. I didn't feel it was any of his business. And so I was a very rebellious school kid, very rebellious. And now here you are sitting here today as an accomplished uh, professor in zoology. So what was the defining factor that caused you to move from rebellion to a more focused approach on schooling? Defiance. My whole life was defiance. What happened was uh, I, I was so non-interested in school, actually rebellious. I refused to learn. If they said you must do something, I did the opposite. And so the point came when they said, well, that's it. Uh, you won't learn. You will go and do a trade and we'll take you out of school. 
And I had, a, I had an uncle who was a headmaster of a school. He was high up in the education. He later became inspector of schools. So when, when they said, well, now your academic schooling is over, you're going to do some trade or something, that's when I decided, no way. They say, A, I'll do B. <laughs> so I went to this uncle and I said, uh, they're going to kick me out of school, can I come to your school? And he says, no, 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 no I don't think I can handle that. You knew all about you by that time, did you? <laughs> yes. But uh, I'll arrange something for you, which he then did, and I went to another school, which was good and it was a disaster. Uh, the other school was a very good English school, so I went from a German school to a very upper-class uh, English school, but it was also very Jewish. And uh, not that I have anything against Jews, but uh, they didn't take too kindly to the fact that I was German. And so I had a tough time in that school for a while, but uh, I'm not too <laughs> non-bombastic myself. <laughs> The underlying message of your story, though, is that Walter made some important choices in his life. They may have been motivated by rebellion, yes. but they were your choices nonetheless. They were my choices, yeah. yes. And so that must have continued as you started your studies and focused on your academic pursuits. That's right. You were making choices to excel in that chosen field. Would, would that right. be a fair characterization? Yes. You know, it's strange. I was atheistic from a very early age. Because of the religious conflict in my home, and I couldn't reconcile the idea that a kind mother would have to go to hell just on the basis of the fact that she wasn't a Roman Catholic. And so, instead of you know debating the issue on its merits, I just discarded all of religion. So I was a very young atheist. I wouldn't have anything to do with God from the age of about eight, nine, nothing. Didn't want to know about God. And so when I went to university, that's also interesting because my schooling was in German and in English. The obvious choice would be an English university. And uh, the other choice was an Afrikaans university, which was not on for me. I wasn't interested in speaking Afrikaans. But then I was very interested in entomology, a science career in entomology. And the only university that actually offered it was the Afrikaans one. And so I enrolled at the Afrikaans University and ended up never doing entomology. <laughs> but that had a major impact on my life because this university was mega evolutionary orientated. It was the bastion of evolution in the country. I mean, it had such famous zoologists in it, like Robert Broom, famous for the misplaced discovery and uh, the whole hominid evolution. So here, when you walked into this department, here was a statue of Broom holding misplaced, you know, the Australopithecine ape hominid. Here it was. And uh, they had fought the battle against religion and won. And you must remember that the Afrikaner is an extremely conservative Christian nationalist. Very, very, very nationalistic, very, very, very staunch in his religion. And they derived from the Dutch Huguenots, the French Huguenots, who had escaped from the tyranny of Europe and had settled in southern Africa and they were going to be moved on their religion. And within this university, this war, evolution, creation had raged and with the discovery of all these so-called hominids and all these mega scientists, uh, there were some big names involved in that university. They had actually won the war. And that meant that evolution was not just an issue of science, it was an issue of pride. Mm. And I came into that atmosphere in that university. And with your rebellious spirit, with your chosen atheistic beliefs, 
you walked into an environment where it was fertile ground for your mind to be absolutely influenced strongly by the evolutionary theory. Uh, not only influenced, it was cut and dried, it was fact, there was, was a given. no conjecture, this was absolute fact, yes. And during that period, as you went through your various degrees in biology and zoology, and as you be, were indoctrinated in the evolutionary fact, uh, were there any times when you had doubts about the logic or the reasoning behind the evolutionary teachings? Well, you see, evolution is a very broad subject. And so you have various paradigms within the evolutionary theory. And our department was a very lively evolutionary orientated department with all sides of the debate incorporated in there. So it's much like religion, you know, you have all of these uh, religious denominations, but they all call themselves Christian. And so we were all evolutionists, but some were gradualists and some were punctuated equilibrianists. Some were lumpers, some were splitters. And so there was always a lively argument. And we used to have what was called a evolutionary discussion class, where all the academics and the postgrad students, the graduate students, would come together and discuss these issues. And these debates were lively. And uh, I always you know, didn't side with the old God. I was more progressive, modern. I was more punctuated, equilibrianist, more like the Gould school of the Harvard side. And the others were very staunch, Darwinistic, gradualistic. Everything happened slowly over a long period of time. So that was probably very f informative for me because we realized that the fossils were not there to show all these intermediary stages. So obviously it had to be punctuated equilibrium. Stability, equilibrium for a long time, then punctuation, rapid evolution, and then you get to the new forms. And that's why you don't have the intermediaries, because it's very rapid, there isn't time for them to accumulate, and you don't find them, they haven't been found yet. And that's where I was from. But I never doubted the theory just the mechanism. So you're in this environment with many competing views and beliefs about the details of evolution. Absolutely. But hook, line and sinker, you believed in the evolutionary theory. You accepted oh, it as fact. No, not even hook, line and sinker. Militant. Militant. Now you must remember the Africana society, very religious. Very, very religious. So if you walk into a classroom situation, your students come from this religious background. And here you start with your evolutionary approach to biology. And everything in our university had an evolutionary approach. You approached every single subject from an evolutionary basis. This was the foundation stone on which you built your biology. And there would be mayhem in the classes because those students would say, now hold on a second, I'm a Christian, I don't believe that. We would get that regularly. But I was a tyrant when it came to that. God didn't exist for me. And how dare this person even question this evolutionary paradigm. I would slaughter those students. And... Uh, often felt that did it, and sometimes felt a twinge of conscience, but uh, that was it. I believed it, absolutely. During that time, you see all these different interpretations of the evolutionary fact. Yes. Didn't the diversity of opinions and the intensity of the debate at any time cause you to doubt whether or not the theory itself was suspect? No. Never. It's like cut and dried, you know, like Christianity. Christ is central to Christianity, you don't doubt that. 
But uh, the various doctrines and the mechanisms, well, that's where you're open to debate. And that's how the denominations work and that's how science works. Just as there is an absolute profound need for faith if you want to be a Christian, there's also a profound fundamental absolute need for faith to be an evolutionary scientist. Absolutely. Evolution is a faith. It's a religion. Uh, I didn't see it then. I just saw it as scientific fact. But if you touch the basis of it, the anger that it generates is just unbelievable. In fact, indescribable. It's uh, all the powers of hell are let loose if you dare touch that paradigm. We had many occasions when we had these creationists around. You know, they were doing their rounds from all the creation organizations, they were traveling to the universities, giving their lectures. And they thought, you know, they were convincing the people with their scientific evidence. We would sit there with this preconceived idea, this person hasn't got the foggiest clue about evolution. And uh, we would just listen to this, never even contemplate whether he could be right or whether he could have a point somewhere, and then just take everything he said, and then take it back to the classroom situation, and absolutely shred it, ridicule it with the students, yeah. until they just, you know, wrote it off as absolute fringe, flat earth society science, if you dared to be a creationist. I'll go further. When I actually started questioning what I was believing, when I got to that point, all I did was write down the questions that did not have a ready answer. In my first public lecture at this particular think tank forum, I didn't raise any counter argument to the evolutionary theory. I just wrote on the board the unanswerable questions from an evolutionary standpoint. And there were a number of them. And just writing them down created such a furor, such an explosion, such anger, even violence, that you, I was stunned. And that's when I realized, whoa, this is not just a scientific debate. Here you're touching a religious core, a nerve. And uh, the anger that it generated was unbelievable. I'll never forget that day. One young student got up, a lady student, and she said, all my life I was a Christian and I believed in creation. Those questions there are inanswerable. Therefore, there is no such thing as evolution. There must be creation. And she looked at the staff member and said, you have all robbed me of my faith. And now I see I need not have been robbed of my faith. And pandemonium broke loose. Unbelievable. It was very, very, very eye-opening. Could you share for us um, the rest of the story concerning your education, uh, what degrees you received, and a little bit about your scientific training and work experience? When I finished my undergraduate degree, I was the only one chosen to actually get a half academic post. So they gave me a half an academic post to help with the training of the undergraduate students while I was doing my honors degree. So your first degree was in biology or zoology? It was biology and chemistry. chemistry. Those were my majors. And when you say half a post, that means like a job? That helped like you earn job. money to they pay gave, for your they tuition? They gave me a junior lecturer, but they shared it between two people. One was a postgrad and uh, of a higher postgrad, and and I was an honor student. They don't normally give it to honor students. You have to be a master student or a PhD student to get that kind of 
assistance, but they gave it to me. So that was very nice and very kind of them. And uh, I had one mentor. He actually moved to Canada after his retirement and was professor at Calgary for a while. He was a, he was a very, very distinguished scientist, well sought after in the entire world. And uh, he took me under his wing. And he became my promoter, my supervisor for my master's and later for my PhD. Actually, he switched universities from the Afrikaans University to Cape Town University. So I also switched universities. So I had my education from Stellenbosch University and my PhD I did at Cape Town University. So I have two university sets of degrees. So I have a BSc, a BSc Honours and a Master's degree from Stellenbosch and a PhD from Cape Town University. And in South Africa, when you do a PhD, is there a, a, a doctrinal thesis and research project that you oh, do? Yes. yes. And what was the subject of that? Well, I was actually working on embryonic nutrition. So I had this nutrition element and uh, we had to work on very new techniques that had sort of just become the vogue. And so I worked with electron microscopy and uh, radioisotope work, tracing the pathway of the nutrients from the maternal to the fetal. And uh, so that was rather interesting stuff. Did that investigation of nutrition at the time um, have any influence on your ultimate acceptance of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine and the health message? Not at the time, but once I had discovered the health message, of course it had a major impact because that was my research. I was given an avenue here. You can go along this route. Before, my research was, it was physiological. I was working on endocrinology and hormone functions and particularly reproductive hormones. I was also doing research. I had a wide variety of subjects. Endocrinology was the one where I was working particularly on the endocrinology of gestation, pregnancy, how it affects various animals in the animal kingdom. Uh, then I was working on fish quite a lot. And I went with the sea fisheries people and we had lots of research on fish and fish reproduction and uh, all of those issues and ecology. I was involved in a NAMIB project, you know, the Namib Desert and the adaptations of animals to a desert environment. So, you know, a, a lot of interesting stuff, working on springbok and white muscle disease, you know, capture disease that they get from stress, how to s prevent them from dying from the capture stress. And so fascinating research. And then when I became an Adventist, well, then the nutrition became paramount. And, and that's quite a fascinating story because uh, whatever the spirit of prophecy says, it seems that people want to do exactly the opposite. And with my rebellious nature, that suits me just down to the ground. Let's check all this stuff out. And so we tested it. And I had lots of graduate students, so I had lots of projects to hand out. And what an amazement. Every single statement can be corroborated scientifically. Unbelievable stuff that we came up with. Scientific evidence to support the spirit of prophecy. Absolutely. 100 years later. 120 years later. Unheard of stuff. My students called me the prophet because I would tell them ahead of time what the result of their experiment would be. They would deny it. They would not believe it. And every time it worked out like, oh, it's obvious stuff. I mean, if you're going to tell a student, here is a carnivore, and if you test that carnivore and you give him meat, his blood parameters and all the parameters will not be as good as when you give him vegetarian food. He'll say, rubbish. This animal is adapted, evolutionary. This is a carnivore. He's going to have the best parameters on meat and not on the other. I said, no, it won't be like this. It'll be like this, 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 this. And I said, I said never. I said, do the experiment. And then they come back and say, huh? <laughs> I can see why they called you the prophet. Yes, and, the, and they were always wrong and I was always right. And the amazing thing is, of course, it was no genius on my part. I was just beginning to 
unravel this relationship. You know, God said, in the beginning, the first diet was, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree with fruit on it, that shall be yours for food. And then he added the vegetable kingdom. Why did he add the vegetable kingdom? Well, there are certain phytochemicals in the vegetables, which with seasonal fruit availability won't be there, so you need these phytochemicals. What do these phytochemicals do? They are antioxidants, they are anti-carcinogenic, they, they have a whole host of functions. Some work on the basis of uh, antioxidant levels or preventing free radical formation. Some are targeted to prevent prostate cancer, some are targeted to prevent breast cancer, some are targeted to alleviate uh, other forms of cancer. It's just amazing. And that's where phytochemical research becomes interesting and you do all of that stuff and it's just fascinating. Walter, with your wealth of knowledge and this scientific empirical evidence, are you suggesting that the statements in the book of Genesis or the Bible about diet and things like that is supportable by scientific fact? Absolutely. In fact, so absolutely that any scientist would be stunned when they see it. And of course, why were the vegetables added? Because all of these nutrients and phytochemicals were added after the fall because of the seasonality that came in. And we really need that stuff. We really need that stuff. The purest and cleanest diet you can probably have is fruit. Uh, when you have digested that, the levels of nitrogenous wastes in your body will be incredibly low. Uh, you will have the energy available to you in a non-invasive manner. So if you eat whole fruits, the, the chances of getting diabetes type 2 is, is virtually impossible if, you, if that were your diet from the beginning. Not only that, the World Health Organization investigated Seventh-day Adventists and came up with a document this thick in a world symposium where they discovered that Seventh-day Adventist diet is the best diet for preventing disease. And, you know, when you go to the animals, then it becomes even more fascinating because the plants of the field were the diet of the animals. That would include the lion, that would include the bear, that would include every carnivore on the planet. Must have been a vegetarian. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Lions and carnivores have big incisors and teeth that are structured, we are taught, to help them capture and consume and tear flesh as part of a meat diet. Now, now you're suggesting you. something different. You're a Canadian, aren't you? Correct. What's 86% of a bear's diet? Vegetables and fruit. <laughs> what kind of teeth has he got? <laughs> He's got the meat eater's teeth. <laughs> and if you had to classify a, con uh, a panda bear, what would you classify him as? Well, the first thought would be that he would be a carnivore because he's a bear. Absolutely. He's classified as a carnivore. That's his official classification. What's his diet? Plants. And just because he has sharp teeth doesn't mean he was designed to eat meat. Now this is where it's interesting. You, you're working with these carnivores and you tell the student, you test the parameters and you go and check it out. Let's say calcium metabolism. I, I was heavy into calcium metabolism. Osteoporosis. Why do animals get hip displacement? Why do sheep develop skew legs? Uh, why do cats have degenerations of the kidneys at a certain stage, all of these issues. And every time you could pinpoint it down to a high animal protein diet. Every time. And uh, you see, a carnivore is an intermittent eater. He's not a constant eater. He's an opportunistic eater. When he gets it, he gets it. If he doesn't get it, he goes hungry, right? Pets aren't fed like that. <laughs> they lie in luxury and sleep all day and you just feed them every day. Well, they deteriorate. Now, what is making them deteriorate? The animal protein causes this high acidity and the hormone cascades are so designed that they can only operate on bone calcium 
for maintenance of asset-based balance. And so everything is designed actually to function on a non-meat diet. In every single animal, doesn't matter what that animal is. This is counterintuitive, and it's a message because of that that is difficult for people to comprehend. But you're saying that yes. you have empirical, physiological evidence from your research Absolutely. that supports your statements. Absolutely. Published evidence. Published evidence. And more experiments than I care to imagine. In peer-review articles. In peer-review articles. And in some of the best pure peer-review uh, articles. Journal of uh, Clinical, of, of Primatology, Journal of Prim I mean, that's a fantastic medical journal. We've got articles in that, absolutely, yes. And yet, notwithstanding this amount of empirical evidence that supports the assertion that animals that are classified as carnivores and seem to be structured to eat meat, that that's not the case. Well, I'll tell you something. Science, by itself, will never convince anyone to believe the Bible. And why is that? Because you are pre-programmed, it is ingrained that there is this evolutionary paradigm. So you will not change. You will have to mythologize it. It's a myth. It's an allegory. Whatever you want to call it. It cannot be scientific fact. So that is a, a story in the Bible. It's probably related to other creation stories and, and the flood stories in the Bible. Those are related to the Babylonian flood models and the Aztec flood models and the this flood model. Somewhere there's a basis there. But that's all myth. But once you start reading it literally, the scientist will say, but you know, there's a screw loose over here somewhere. But once you start testing it, you actually find well, it could be like that, but it takes another jump. It takes a mega leap. And to get that mega leap, you have to first discover that God is and that he is personally involved in your life. Otherwise, you would never make that leap. You wouldn't make that leap. And so it's when I discovered prophecy and when I discovered that history is written in advance that I was cornered. Particularly Daniel 7 just blew me away. I mean, here was such a magnificent description of history in advance. There was no gainsaying. There was no way around it. That's the way it is. It stuns me that there are people in churches today who don't see it. The whole of the Reformation saw it. They hewed it in stone. And today, people are so blasé. They don't care anymore. There it is. You study it. It's black on white. And if it's there, then there must be a God who wrote it there. So my first experience with God was intellectual, not emotional. The way you characterize the scientific community and scientists is in complete contradiction to the conventional wisdom about what scientists are. Yes. There's supposed to be learned, informed, objective, yeah. and accomplished at uh, eliminating personal bias such that they do objective work and therefore the results of their work is reliable. You're saying something completely different. I would like to suggest that you read, let's say, the greatest proponent living today on the evolutionary paradigm, which would be Dawkins, right? And he wrote some of these magnificent books on evolution. And you read his books, you will f see the, uh, how vehemently attacking he is against anything that is remotely connected to God. He will call uh, the creator of the eye a tinkerer. He will be derogatory to the nth degree when it comes to anything religion. There's an emotion involved, of, in, involved there. That, this is not just a scientific basis. No, there's an emotion. And uh, I can understand it because I had the same emotion. I know where he's coming from. And he cannot make that paradigm shift. Of course, what he writes is, excuse me, total garbage, but he doesn't know it because it's perfectly logical. Do you think he doesn't know it, or 
that he does know it or has some doubts, but isn't strong or courageous enough to accept that line of inquiry. He won't entertain the doubt. But I'm interested to see in his latest book, he writes, God almost certainly does not <laughs> exist, which is a misnomer in itself. You can't almost yeah. certainly yeah. not exist. He's either there or he isn't. He's either there or he isn't, yeah. Very good. So let's come back to your scientific career. Uh, the atheist, the rebel, the accomplished scientist doing all this incredible research. At what point did you begin to question this intensive adoption of the evolutionary concept? When a simple carpenter came to put in a kitchen into my house, and he was a Christian, and he wanted to tell me about God, and I told him that uh, I'm not interested in his garden, you can put him in his pocket and leave, I just want the kitchen. <laughs> You didn't beat around the bush by the no, sounds no, of it. No, no, I was very straight. He was, he almost staggered back. <laughs> it, when it came to God, you, uh, I was not interested. And, uh, you know, you will have these people knocking on the door and th they were food. <laughs> and I was the dog. <laughs> the carnivore. <laughs> I was the carnivore. Yes, and, and then things happened in my house which which really made me think that there must be something else. And I was very involved in the esoteric world. Strange enough, you know, the esoteric world was okay as long as I was not the underdog and there was some high up deity who would tell me what I was to do. My whole life was a life of rebellion. I certainly wasn't going to knuckle under to any deity. And esoteric world is just perfect because you become the deity. And uh, here I went into the esoteric world and then my house went haywire to the point where I actually phoned that carpenter when I found his little pamphlet that he'd left me, which was so simple it just said that the commandments had been changed. And by what authority had they been changed? Which is such a simple question. Mm. And it intrigued me. Yeah, I don't understand this, you know. Here it says the commandments have been changed. Get me a Bible. We searched high and low for a Bible. Finally found one. I compared catechism. Well, when I asked him, please come and explain what's going on here. And he did a simple study on Daniel 7. That the little horn power, which could only be Rome, changed the law. Well, that just blew me away. But that opened a can of worms. Because if he changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, then what's the big deal? Because the Sabbath is a memorial to creation, right? So what's, what's the big deal here? Uh, excuse me, in six days the Lord made and therefore you have to keep the Sabbath. Makes no sense if you're an evolutionist. No world was made in six days. It came into existence over millions of years. And so I had endless arguments with him about this. But as far as the the history was concerned, I couldn't get out of it. I tried. I even went to the professors in the university, in the theology of the professors. I happened to play squash with the one. He was a, a Greek professor. And so I wanted to know, you know, he knows the Bible. Tell me, what's it say here? Does it really say that in the original? Yes. And what's the history say? Couldn't be changed. That's the way it was. And so there was this dichotomy, this war. And then eventually, if the one is right, then why is the other one not right? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then I, he, he started bringing me creationist books, which I read and thought, oh, these are garbage, you know. <laughs> Take this drivel away. <laughs> and I had arguments with him and said to him, nah, forget about it, this is idiocy. But you kept talking to him. I kept talking to him because of the... the the historic data and the prophetic data, the fascinating thing is the, the creation story wouldn't let go. And when I said to him, you know, you have nothing to offer that's scientifically valid, he came to the point where he said, well, that's not my problem, that's your problem, you're the scientist. <laughs> and that's when I started thinking, 
And that's when I started investigating, and that's when I started making lists. And fortunately, or unfortunately, I was busy with uh, genetics with the, with the graduate students at that time. I was teaching a course in genetics, and all of these mega questions on evolution really boil down to the genes in the end, right? Everything is based on the genes. And how the genes involved and where they came from in the first place. And that's where the first really big questions started arising. And those are the ones that I listed. You know, where did the first gene come from? The enzyme systems to create it weren't there, so it has to be chance or design. So what was the next step then in this trans formation in Walter Veith that took him from asking questions to actually accepting that his, the cornerstone of his existence, the evolutionary faith, was in fact flawed? Well, the first, the first concrete evidence was when I asked the questions, they created a nuclear explosion. Mm. And just asking the questions was enough to have you ostracized. Your colleagues, didn't want to speak to me anymore. I was enemy number one, and all I'd done was ask questions. And so I felt, well, you know, this is not just an academic question. This is a religious question. And I investigated more and more and more, and then uh, I eventually came to the point where I said, well, I'm not going to go along with this, and uh, offered to resign which they wouldn't allow. And they even took me up to the rectorate level to try and talk some sense into my head. And uh, there it appeared that it, it definitely was a religious question. And so I, I left the university at that stage. I was later contacted by another university and uh, they said to me, I can teach the physiology. I don't have to do the evolution. That's fine. They just want me to come on board there which I did, and then uh, the opportunity arose to go to geoscience. They had some faithful, uh, believing, solid people at geoscience. I'm talking people like Ariel Roth was there, Harold Coffin was there, and they took me on field trips and we did some of the geology and I started seeing the other side of the story and a lot of it made tremendous sense. And then I started packaging it in my own paradigm and developing my own. And then I started lecturing on it. And that's how it happened. And when in that process did you make the decision to become an Adventist Christian? When I, when I realized that the problems, that some of the problems in the evolutionary paradigm were actually insurmountable. And the amazing thing is, remember there's this dichotomy in the department from gradualism to punctuated equilibrianism? I had been in that one corner up there and the rest of the old guard were in this corner down here. And in order to defend that position, I had to know the science. And so I read every single thing about you know, the transitional fossils and why they're not there and how the time frames are being shrunk to make sure that you can actually get this rapid advance without leaving a fossil trace behind. I was very au fait with that science. Purely on the basis that I had to out-debate the old God. So this was academic pride. And now, everything that I had studied, well, if it comes down to it, there is no evidence for evolution. You only have this and then you have that. And the whole argument is, why don't you have that in between to get to there? So what's the next jump? To go to creation from there is a minor jump. It's just a 180 degree turn and say, well, if that evidence is not there, maybe it shouldn't be there because it just isn't there. You understand? Mm, I do. And so this debate actually prepared my mind for the next step. So your conversion story is telling us that God led you to him through the power of your mind and your reason rather than some 
cathartic emotional conversion. Oh, is yes. that true? The first thing that the people started saying when I started converting is uh, he was struck by lightning and woke up a Christian one morning and didn't believe anything he did anymore. Now, the furthest from the truth. I had a purely logical, academic conversion, mm. totally academic, based on historic fact, as uh, depicted there in the prophecies, based on science, based on the questions that I asked. I had a totally intellectual conversion. I knew nothing about Jesus Christ. I had no personal relationship with him. I had no walk with him. I wasn't struck by lightning. I didn't fall over and speak in tongues one morning. Nothing like that. And purely on that rational basis, I decided, well, if this is there, and that is there, then he must be there. Some Christians argue that unless you have that emotional conversion, you're not really moved by the Holy Spirit and your conversion isn't real. How would you respond to that? If you don't have that emotional experience there in the beginning, then the only thing that you have is faith. If you have the emotional experience, then you don't need that much faith anymore. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith, in my opinion, is more biblical than the emotional. And so here I had nothing but faith. I didn't know God. And I, by faith, accepted there he is. So if you are there, well, I want to meet you. And then we started our life together and circumstances in our life were such that if at the end of the process you deny that he doesn't exist, then you are brain dead. He does exist because the involvement that he has is not one of euphoria, but one of relationship, of actually being there by faith. I accept he is there and he's involved in my life. So by rejecting it, you're either brain dead. I guess the other alternative is that you're just being intellectually dishonest with yourself. In the face of all of that truth, if you reject that truth, you're not being honest with yourself. Well, then you're not being honest because here you have all the proof that you want. There will always be hooks to hang your doubts on. Yes. You won't have every clear and cut answer. But whatever I investigated, the biblical paradigm had sufficient evidence to be substantiated. And so I accepted by faith. This is correct. And the more you study, the more it opens up. And you can start understanding the battle between good and evil. And particularly... The personal battle in my own life suddenly made sense when I came to Daniel chapter 7. And this whole question of this animosity between the religious groups suddenly started making sense. And there it was written in the Bible as to exactly what would happen and how it would happen. How did your scientific and university colleagues respond uh, to your conversion? And, and you being a Christian scientists now? Well, I would say 99% of them with absolute horror and disdain and disgust. And a certain percentage, they couldn't understand it. Now, you know, if I'd been just average down there, they would probably say, nah. But they couldn't do that. I mean, I, I don't want to blow trumpet or anything, but you know, I, w I was a top academic. I had the highest marks, I had the distinctions in my degrees, I was a go-getter, I had awards, I received bursaries, I received all kinds of awards. Eventually even getting the Royal Society Award for my science. I mean, only five scientists outside of Britain get chosen for that sort of thing. I mean, you know, you, you can't just be Joe Blow in order to get that. Not so easy to dismiss Walter Weith in view of those accomplishments. That was a problem. Yeah. That was a problem. So they would like to ridicule you, you know, but then they have this, this problem. And I've had many 
private, secret discussions where people would come to my office and say they've looked at it, they've, they see it, and secretly they admit that I, that I have a point. You know, after I've given lectures and explained why, they would secretly admit it. High people, deans of scientific faculties would come to me and say, I believe, but don't ever expect me to support you publicly. And others would be vehemently opposed. Whew, terrible. They would say, you, I even had a, uh, a commission of, in, of inquiry and the accusation was, you cannot believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. That was the, the, the official accusation. So you're, you're a, a scientist who has adopted the Christian faith and are believing the Bible. The more you investigated it, the more the science seemed to support it. Yes. I'm more. I'm, I'm not just a Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist That's Christian. just where I was going with my question, Walter. How do, does a Christian who begins to explore these questions and see the scientific evidence to support the Bible, which is an incredible, miraculous wonder to begin with, how does you go from there to be a Seventh-day Adventist? The Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, in most areas of the world is the sect. And, and, and they've lost it. You know, they're just keeping this strange day and they have this the strange woman prophet and uh, they're in the same category in most minds as the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. And that's it. Don't have anything to do with them. But when you study the history and you study uh, the everlasting gospel, what is the everlasting gospel? An everlasting gospel is one that has never changed. So your perception of law and grace must have been the same throughout history if it's an everlasting gospel. Your perception of prophecy must be unchangeable because God doesn't change. Your view of salvation must be unchangeable because God doesn't change his, over, his modus operandi of salvation, does he? If he's the same yesterday, today and forever, it must be consistent, right? And how were Adam and Eve saved? Blood of the Lamb. How were the Jews saved? They had to bring a lamb. They had to slaughter the lamb. They were saved by the blood of the lamb. But that's not what modern theology says. They were under the law. They were saved by the law. And we are under grace. That's a misnomer. You cannot have grace without a broken law. And the law has to stand. And you have to be a transgressor of that law in order to qualify for grace. So... What does the Christian world teach? And then what does it teach on prophecy? What did Paul teach? What did Jesus teach? What did John teach? What did the reformers teach on prophecy? And that is everlasting. Now let's draw that line. Who teaches it today? Only the Seventh-day Adventist Church has the, the early opinion of Paul, John and all the reformers on prophecy, including the day year principle, which is not Adventist, it is prophetic and it's there right from the beginning. And you can go to the Bible, you can go to the reformers, and you can go to the Adventists, they're the only ones. The rest of the worlds are either preterist or futurist. Only the Seventh day Adventist church is historic continuous. And that's the biblical paradigm. Luther used it, Melanchthon used it, Calvin used it, Knox used it, Cranmer used it. You name it, they all used it. So, Walter, the facts are uh, impressive. Absolutely. Just, and the reasoning behind your assertions are, are very logical and support your case. But we're sitting here having a discussion about Christians. Yes. And what you're saying is that Adventist Christians are a unique type of Christian in many ways, but fundamentally are unique because they have the truth, whereas sounds, the other Christians That sounds are incredibly not. arrogant, but let me ask you a question. A remnant mm -hmm. is something that looks like the original, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So a remnant must teach what the original taught. You go to the early church fathers, the earliest church fathers, 
They teach exactly the same as the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. You go to the Reformation, they had the same view of prophecy. They might not have had the full picture, but they had the same basic principles as the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. And when you go to the children of the Reformed churches, none of them have the view. Not one of them has the view of the Reformers. They've all rejected it. So they have a different cloth. They have a different belief system. They've exchanged their view on the Antichrist for futurism, largely. Some of them cling to preterism. They have, uh, many of them, an antinomian theology. The law is gone. We are now under grace. We have all these theologies out there which are not consistent with the early church, which are not consistent with the Reformation, so they are disqualified as a remnant. They cannot be a remnant. It has to be like the original. So how do you present these overwhelmingly persuasive facts to other Christians without coming across arrogant or uh, like a sect or like a rebel? Well, you see, when I started out, I would explain what the Bible says. I say, here it is, and there it is, and there it is, and there it is, and you take it, swallow it, eat it, that's it. I don't do that anymore. I say, this is what, this is what these people said, that's what these people said, that's what these people said, and that's what we're saying over here. What happened in between? So now it's not the Seventh-day Adventist church that has, you know, the knowledge and has eaten it by the shovel load. This is a continuous truth that has never ever changed. And if you've had a paradigm shift here in the middle, then you've disqualified yourself as the remnant. And if you have this paradigm shift, then you will be at loggerheads with the remnant. But you're not really at loggerheads with them. You're at loggerheads with the reformers as well. And you're at loggerheads with the Bible. You really have to do some biblical contortion to come to futurism or preterism. It's untenable. It's not supportable. The power of that logic and the overwhelming historical and biblical evidence and, and that supports it on its own isn't enough to convince those that, for example, believe Sunday is the day, the Lord's day, rather than the exactly. true Sabbath on Saturday. It's not enough to convince people that their belief structure within their church isn't supported by the Bible. So if the logic and the facts isn't enough, what else is there? Nothing that you can say or do will convince anybody. And the Bible already says this. All we can do is so. But we cannot convict. So that's the missing equation, right? On the basis of logical, logic alone, I can defend my faith. In fact, I'll go this far and say that the Seventh-day Adventist faith is the only faith in the entire world that can defend its doctrines on a public platform. No other faith can do that. Not a Billy Graham, not a Shula, no matter who they are, they cannot defend their doctrines. They can preach Christ. They can bring people to Christ. But they cannot defend their doctrines on a public platform. Only the Seventh-day Adventist Church can do that. And that's why they have public meetings. Other people have to go sneaking behind back doors and go knocking on doors. We can stand in a public hall. If we're so wrong, where are the theologians that stand up and say, excuse me, let me point out over here, you're wrong over here. Why are they never there? Because they know they can't do it. Because this is fact, this is fact, but that doesn't change the heart. That takes something else, that takes the Holy Spirit's working. And it's not our work it's not to my convict. Work. It's not my job. Yeah. Okay.